Gather around, boys, it's time for another grand adventure in the Protestant land. I was thinking of uh, tackling some atheist issues this week, but a fan requested that I tackle this guy. Isaiah Salde, 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 Saldivar? Saldivar? Mr. Samir Naga... 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 Not gonna work here anymore anyway. <laughs> So check your pint, make sure it's full, and let's go. We're going to see if he's got anything new to offer. People often have no clue what is the difference between a Christian and a Catholic. Trick question, they're the same thing. And some Catholics don't even know the difference. Some Catholics would say, we're just like you. We claim to be Christian, we're Christians. Hey, that's what I just said. But seriously, if you want to claim otherwise, then let's get to it. And some Christians would say, Catholics are definitely not Christian. So. This, this is exactly the same thing as saying that some Christians say that Christians aren't Christians. Of course Christians are Christians, otherwise they wouldn't be Christians. I wish this guy would stop playing Protestant and become Christian. I'm going to speak directly to what Catholics teach, not what Catholics all believe. What? What, what is this babble? He's going to tell us? He's going to tell us what Catholics teach but don't believe? What? There's many Catholics watching this that say, I don't believe that. Can you find people in the pews of the church who reject the teachings of the church? Sure. But this would be kind of like being a PETA member and eating meat. Just because someone attends the meetings doesn't mean that they're actually part of what they claim to be. But again, I'm speaking to what does the Catholic Church teach? Just like there's many Christians that say, I don't believe this doctrine or that doctrine that Christianity teaches. As we're about to see. This guy rejects, like, many core tenets of Christianity. I don't think he should be allowed to use this title at all. An article on Catholicism I found stated, the number of Roman Catholics in the world is nearly 1.1 billion. It's greater than that of all other religious traditions. I don't know if this needs to be pointed out, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. This appears to be a ceremony to Kali, a Hindu goddess, and... and Definitely not a Catholic ceremony happening here. There are more Roman Catholics than all other Christians combined. Well, I think you just answered your own question. If all Protestant denominations are considered by you to be other Christians, then therefore Catholics must be considered Christians, right? And more, more Roman Catholics than Buddhists and Hindus. Although there's more Muslims than Roman Catholics, the number of Roman Catholics is greater than that of the individual traditions of Shi and Sunni Islam. Crazy. It's almost like we obeyed Christ's command to go into all nations and make disciples. So there's a lot of Catholics in the world. We have a lot of Catholics that watch our content, that comment on our videos, that are in our Discord. And I think it's important today in the video that we talk about the differences. And by the end of the video, I hope to answer, are Catholics and Christians the same? I feel like I've answered that like four times now. All right, let's start by difference number one, what Catholicism teaches versus what Christianity teaches. And the first topic is salvation. Christians believe that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. Christians don't believe that. Protestants do. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So he's going to go to these verses. These are just classic, classic verses that ripped out of their context might look a little bit like they support the Protestant point, but really aren't even strong enough on their own to, to make that point. But if you go just a little further and get that context, you'll see it doesn't preach the faith alone that he's insisting on. First, Christians and Protestants, you need to hear this. You can't work your way to heaven. There's no amount of good works that you can do to get yourself into heaven. You need to have faith in Jesus Christ. You need to be baptized. God gives you his grace. And without his grace, you cannot continue in your faith and you cannot continue in good works. But if you read Ephesians verse 10, it tells us that we have to abide in good works. We have to walk in them or we have to do them. It, depending on the translation that you use, there's different ways of phrasing it, but we have to do them. What happens if you, Christian or Protestant, fail to do good works? What happens if you, Christian or Protestant, stop doing good works? And Galatians will also make this very clear over and over that we are saved by faith, not by works. So you're not going to try to back that one up, huh? 
It is our faith that saves us, not our works. Works are the byproduct of salvation, not a means to earning salvation. They are the fruit of salvation, not the key to salvation, okay? But what happens when you're Christian, you're living in Christ, and you stop doing good works, or as he says it, and you know, as the Bible says it, stop bearing fruit, or at least stop bearing good fruit. What happens? What happens to that Christian? I don't know. I, I wish there was some verse that could help me out here, but maybe there isn't. But I would wonder, I would just strongly wonder if they are maybe a little more key than Isaiah here is is letting on. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 3.28 says, For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So as Isaiah gallops through these verses without any context or laying down any sort of meaning to what these verses say, uh, he fails to recognize that there can be nuance to what you believe. You see, we believe that there is initial justification. You are dead in your sin. And then you are dead to yourself and you rise again with Jesus through baptism. And we are saved. But then what happens if you commit a mortal sin and you fall out of grace with God? You can be justified again. This takes going to confession. This takes getting right with God and joining his church again. This is how we are justified again. And then we are continually justified through the good works that we do and the avoidance of sin. We can have these nuances. That's why we can say Paul, when he writes about being saved through faith, and James, who says we're justified by our works, they need not be in any sort of contradiction that needs to be so fiercely fought for. Jesus himself says that we have to obey him. We have to abide in him. We have to bring forth good fruit. Otherwise, what he does, does he do? He cuts us off and throws us into the fire. So it's clear. We are justified and saved by faith. And that is the core to what Christians believe and what Christianity, Orthodox Christianity teaches when it comes to salvation. What Orthodox Christianity teaches? Isaiah, who died and made you Pope? Catholicism teaches salvation is not by faith alone, but comes through baptism, good works, and remaining in a state of grace. And in 9, in the Council of Trent says, If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified, let him be damned. Actually, the word used by the council is not damned. It is anathema. And they don't mean the same thing at all. Anathemas, there's different levels of anathema, but anathemas generally mean exclusion from the faithful and from the church. You are excluded from the sacraments. And if you're a good Christian, you know how necessary and vital the sacraments are. Now, if you're a Protestant, they don't mean a whole lot, so it's just so much scarier to say damned. But please, Isaiah, precision of language. Uh, Canon 9, the Council of Trent, this was the response to the reformers when they declared that the Bible was stating that we are saved by faith alone. The Bible makes this explicitly clear. So, faith alone was mentioned one time in the entire Bible. Is baptism. Christians believe baptism is a symbolic act that demonstrates a person's faith in Christ and their identification with Christ in burial and resurrection. Don't be ridiculous, you silly goose. Christians don't believe that because the Bible doesn't say that. Baptism is not a saving act in itself. But baptism points to the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and we should all get baptized after coming to the faith. But why? This is what Peter preached in Acts 2.38. Repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. Well, he actually says repent for the remission of sins. 
So baptism is important and we believe that it is necessary, but it's not the saving act to where you're saved and it's not a necessity to salvation. So it's necessary for what exactly? You can get saved and then die 20 minutes later and still be go to heaven even if you're not baptized. And we saw that with the thief on the cross. We see that in the book of Acts as well. Laying aside the fact that the thief on the cross was was there before the institution of baptism, um, God is not bound by the sacraments. We are. We follow the sacraments. God promises us grace through the sacraments. But God can offer his grace to whomever he wants. Hey, Calvinists, how's that for sovereignty? Catholicism teaches that baptism, baptism cleanses from original sin and is a saving act. Now, I just want to point out, this looks like a Eastern Orthodox baptism that's about to happen. Um, could be Eastern Catholic, but I, I don't know as much about Eastern Catholicism as I would like to know. So if any of you are Eastern Catholic or familiar with them, let me know in the comments if I have uh, have that right. The Council of Trent, Trent teaches that the Ten Commandments are obligatory for Christians and that the justified man is still bound to keep them and all men may attain salvation through faith, baptism, and the observ observance of the commandments. Is he actually suggesting Christians shouldn't keep the Ten Commandments? Or that there's no consequences if they don't keep the Ten Commandments? Why the constant rah 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 about icons or statues of Mary or anything else like that? They try to use the Ten Commandments to justify their stance on that. Are we not bound by the Ten Commandments? Then that whole point is moot! And there's nowhere in the Bible where infants were baptized, there's nowhere in the Bible where babies are baptized. Now, I don't want to make an argument from silence here. And neither can Isaiah. Because the fact is the Bible doesn't tell us much about children who are born into families of believers. All it tells us is certain instances where the whole household is baptized. And Protestants may try to say, oh, well that only means the believers in the household. But that's not what the text says. So what do we have to go on to really exclude or include infants? into baptism. Well, we look at the ancient, ancient church. And if we look at the ancient church, and I dare say the ancient churches that exist today, then we have a very clear idea of infants getting baptized. At no point in history is this an issue. When the Oriental Orthodox left, left the Catholic Church, it was not over infant baptism. When the Eastern Orthodox left the church. It was not over infant baptism. And if they come back to the church, and many, many of the Oriental and Eastern Orthodox churches have come back into communion with the Catholic Church, it was not over infant baptism. Orthodox Christianity. You keep using the word. I don't know think it means what you think it means. We do not teach or preach that there is baptism. Uh, we baptize infants or baptize babies. It is after you come to Christ, then you get baptized according to the book of Acts and the Bible. Like I said, we only see that when it's an adult convert. Otherwise, it says household. Number three difference, praying to the saints. Christians believe that prayer is an act of worship. We most certainly do not. And there's no way you can point to a verse in the Bible that says that prayer is an act of worship. And we should only pray to God as instructed by Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to need you to be specific because I just went and checked Matthew 6 and it doesn't say anything like that. Christians are never taught to pray to a deceased person. And biblically, it would be close to necromancy, which is communicating with the dead, which scripture prohibits. You know, here I agree with Isaiah almost completely. Like, we do not communicate with the dead. You do not pray to the dead at all. Like that, Necromancy is a sin. It is, it is probably a mortal sin. Fortunately, that's not an issue for Catholics because we believe the evangelicals' favorite verse in the whole Bible, John 3.16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All the saints in heaven are alive in God forever. 
Catholicism teaches there's a great value in praying to deceased saints because they can intercede on God's behalf for us. Let's clean up his language here just a little bit because he's kind of a mess. I think what he meant is that they intercede on our behalf to God, which makes a lot more sense than what he said, and I think that's what he meant. However, uh, the Apostle Paul frequently exhorts believers to pray for one another, to pray for each other, to intercede for each other. And we do those things, whether they're alive here on earth or they're alive in heaven. Catholics also pray to Mary and other various saints. Some Catholics say, no, we don't, but their doctrine states in CCC 2679, and I quote, I've never seen or heard or heard of a Catholic denying that we pray to the saints and to Mary in heaven. I've never, never even heard of that. And if they go to mass, then they know that we pray the litany of the saints and we pray the, the Hail Mary or the, the Ave Maria or the Salve Regina. Yeah, it's what we do. Because she's alive in heaven and can intercede in her prayers. Mary is the perfect prayer, a figure of the church. When we pray to her, we are adhering with her to the plan of the Father who sends his Son to save all men. Like the beloved disciple, we welcome Jesus' mother into our homes, for she has become the mother of all the living. We can pray with and to her. The prayer of the church is sustained by the prayer of Mary and united with it in hope. That was some of the best preaching I've ever heard from a Protestant, even if he was just quoting the Catechism. Number four, the afterlife. Christians believe there's literally a heaven and hell, and when a Christian dies, he either goes to heaven with Christ for eternity, or unbelievers go directly to a place of torment called hell. There's no middle ground. There's no waiting place. It is obvious here he's going to start talking about purgatory. But before, before, before we get to that, we need to note that there was a waiting place that Jesus spoke about, that the early church believed in, that the Jews believed in, and this was the place where the dead went. There were two places, two rooms, if you will. One was a place of torment that will get cast into the lake of fire at the end of time. The other is a place of paradise known as Abraham's bosom. This is not heaven. The gates of heaven were not open yet. Jesus had not yet uh, died on the cross. So, even after Jesus emptied this waiting place and brought the saints there into heaven, this waiting place still exists. In fact, it is a place where those who have rejected God are waiting for their final punishment. This is an immediate judgment based on who you put your faith in and how you lived your life. John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from, de passed from death to life. Hey, that's what Catholics believe. So we believe you either go to heaven or you go to hell. Catholicism teaches that those who die that know God either go directly to heaven or a place called purgatory for further purification through pain. Inevitably, this comes up and they have an idea of what purgatory is and it's not an accurate idea and it's based more on medieval ideas, superstitions among the laity than any actual church teachings ever. Because purgatory is not defined as a place and Current theologians seem to suggest it is much more of a process, a process of final sanctification before coming into the presence of God. Or I've heard some people articulate it, it is coming into the presence of God, and God's glorious holiness burns away that remnant of sin from you. And, and this idea is found in the Bible, it's found in 1 Corinthians, it's found in 2 Maccabees, and... It's not unique to Catholics either, because Protestants believe that you have to be sanctified in coming to the presence of God. 
And they just take it for granted that this is something that will happen when you die and go to heaven, but they don't ever stop to think about what sort of a process that might be involved. How long someone stays depends on many factors, including prayers and financial donations from people still alive. Thanks, Tetzel. Number five, confessing sin. Christians believe the only mediator between God and man is Jesus Christ, according to 1 Timothy 2.5. Why, yes, we do believe that. But what does that mean, Isaiah? Catholics or Catholicism teaches you need to confess to a priest who has delegated power of absolution. Absolution is the authority that Jesus gave to the apostles and to their predecessors, which is the power to forgive or retain sin. This is recorded for us in John. When the priest forgives your sin, when he absolves you, it is not the man, the priest, sitting there who absolves you. It is Christ who absolves you through the instrument who is the priest. Forgiveness is not based on the atoning work of the cross alone, but also based on other works. No, no, it is only through the atoning work of Jesus Christ that any of this is even possible. We can talk about purgatory. We can talk about the confessional. We can talk about putting our trust in Jesus Christ or whatever else we want to talk about in this discussion. Without the sacrifice on the cross, it is all meaningless. So you need to confess your sin to the priest and the priest has delegated power to forgive you of your sins and he may require some type of giving or some type of sacrament or some type of act to also forgive you of your sin. Okay, okay, Isaiah. It's like everything you know about Catholicism comes from Hollywood and Baptist preachers. And you can't trust either one when it comes to depicting the church Jesus Christ founded. Remember, the world is going to hate Christians. The world is going to hate the church he founded. Why would you turn to the world to get your ideas? I mean, this, this sounds like Hollywood. Number six is view on the Bible. Christians believe there are 66 books, which are official canon of scripture. Catholics teach that there are 73 books as scripture, including books, which Christians refer to as the Apocrypha. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Of course, Christians believe in all 73 books of the Bible. I mean, it is Protestants who took a set of scissors to it. Even the proto-Christians, by which I mean the apostles, believed in the 73 books of the Bible. If they didn't, they wouldn't have consistently and constantly quoted from the Septuagint. Nor would the early church fathers have believed in these books' canonicity. You want to know where the Protestants get their canon? From a 2nd century Jewish council that was trying to push back against the growth. Of Christianity. So this is not only 66, there's extra books that the leaders of the Catholic Church have des uh, designated as canon. You know what? Sure, let's give them this one. The Catholic Church added them in. They put them back in after Martin Luther decided to cut them out. Christians hold the authority of scripture much higher as Catholics do. I think he means than, not as Catholics do. But you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we Christians believe that it's the inspired word of God. And because it's the inspired word of God, we wouldn't dare take a set of scissors to it and chop out the books that we don't like. And we certainly wouldn't dare to twist a couple out of context verses into, into teaching such uh, heretical things as faith alone. Christians don't do that stuff. So for us, scripture has a much higher level of authority than the Catholics? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Protestants don't have a higher respect of the Bible. Than Catholics do. What they have a higher respect for is their own garbage interpretation of the Bible. They love playing Pope. There's also many other differences like the priesthood, Catholic mass, transubstantiation, uh, the Pope. I mean, the list goes on and on. Yeah, definitely just go ahead and take his word on all those things. In eight minutes here, let us answer the question, are Christians and Catholics the same for just some of the points I described, the answer would be absolutely not. Christians and Catholics do not believe the same thing. After watching this video, I'm almost convinced that every time he says Catholic, he means Protestant. 
And let me give this word to some Catholics that are watching that follow our ministry. Do not be a Catholic just because you are saved. Did he misspeak again? Did he call Catholics saved? Are they not saved? Make up your mind, Isaiah. Are a Catholic or you grew up in the Catholic Church or you are a traditional Catholic because your family. Many Catholics you talk to, they don't practice, they don't go to church, they just say, oh, well, my mom or dad was Catholic. Literally anything that you believe, anything that you believe, if you just believe it because your family believes it, you do need to challenge those beliefs. I agree with them there. But I want to challenge you, search the scripture, look for yourself, and see if your belief contradicts a lot of what the Bible teaches. And it does. A lot of what Catholics teach contradicts the 66 books of the Bible that we hold as scripture. Yeah, sure. Search the scriptures because, as I showed in this video, there's plenty of verses that teach the exact opposite of what he's trying to make the Bible say. And as far as his 66 books that we believe, no, Mr. Pope, you believe. You don't get to stick your potpourri on us. Well, I hope you liked the video. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, do the whole thing. If you didn't like the video, go ahead and give me a thumbs down. Um, let me know why in the comments. And subscribe anyway. Hate watch me for a while. Lastly, I did start a Patreon. You're welcome to go over there, and I'd really appreciate anything that you could give. Um, that said, I am looking for someone to design like a logo for me so that I can start putting stuff on merch and getting that out there. If you know anyone, or you yourself are talented and want to offer your services, and I'm willing to pay a fair price, let me know, and we'll see if we can work something out. In the meantime, go to confession, do your penance, and remember, go to Mass. And remember, Go to Mass. And remember, go to Mass.